Hello and welcome to FACTS webinar call, called Mayshawn Hogs 101. Our guest presenter is Laura Jensen. I am Larissa McKenna, FACTS Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Before we dive in, let me just take a minute or two for a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust are facts. We are a national nonprofit. We're headquartered in Illinois, and we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also by helping consumers make informed food choices. So my wonderful fact colleague, Samantha, and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, uh, and we get to the honor and pleasure of working with livestock and poultry farmers from across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorship, and of course, webinars on many fascinating topics. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about our farmer services. This time, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Laura Jensen. Laura wears many hats. Uh, I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. But we are very, very lucky to have her with us today to share her extensive experience and her expertise on Mayshawn Hogs. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Laura, or should I say Mrs. Mayshawn? Please, <laughs> <laughs> please take it away. I go by a lot of names. Uh, first, I have to thank you again, Larissa and Sam, um, not just today, but you know, when COVID hit and, and my retail store was going nuts, you were there to reach out and offer a grant so that I could rebuild my website to better serve our customers. And uh, fact has always been there for us as farmers, and I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you uh, so, for being here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, all in all, um, I have four businesses that I run. Um, I am the president of the American Mayshawn Breeders Association. Uh, I have a consulting business called The Pig Nerd. I also own my own retail store that has a manufactured foods and butcher shop and charcuterie shop here in my own uh, in my barn on my farm. And then, of course, I have the live pig operation, which is Mayshawn Preservation. In Mayshawn Preservation, uh, I also house the remaining foundation herd for the Mayshawns in the U.S. There are four of them left, and I've had the honor of having the last seven here on my farm. Uh, I do also uh, operate my own breeding program where um, my, my goal this year after what we've done in the past is to work on an ideal meat hog for the Mayshawn. Um, <clears throat> so I can talk from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, it's amazing the group that we have together for the Mayshans because each of us seem to bring something to the table that make the association and the Mayshan journey just, just phenomenal. I've seen a lot of those farmers that are here today with me uh, to, uh, to join in and support our work, and, and I appreciate every single one of them. Um, so as far as the registry itself, um, I took that over in 2020 when Rico retired. Uh, and it was in danger uh, of not making it, actually. The Mayshawn was in significant danger of, of not succeeding in the U.S. So what my husband and I did is we rebuilt that herd. Um, I had inherited over 50 hogs that needed to be delivered to customers that had been waiting up to two years. Um, and by the time we had hogs on the ground, uh, we were over 100 hogs on that wait list. So um, I have flown pigs across the country to, again, some of these great members that are on here. Uh, and I've done a little bit of everything when it comes to the Mayshawn, either uh, from the live hog operation, my retail store, or through the association. So um, I'm looking forward to your questions, and I should be able to give you a, a pretty well-rounded um, explanation. <laughs> Thank you. I should have said next slide. I'll get it together. So, so let's start with the history of the Mayshawn. Uh, a lot of you may have know, known this, but I'm just going to jump in with it. Uh, we know that they're over 5,000 years old, which makes them possibly the oldest breed of hog in the world. Uh, we have um, uh, books that were Darwin books that we can see that the Mayshawn hog was actually drawn in them, um, which is kind of where we get that point of reference from the age of the hog. Uh, initially, they were reserved for the emperors of China as far as their meat, because it is a red meat. <clears throat> Excuse me, it does have some micro marbling. And then um, some new information uh, that we've been working on through the association is that um, 
there may have been some some different body shapes and in types of Maishans that were part of that importation that came over in the late 80s from China. So um, definitely uh, follow us on the American Maishan Breeders Association for that as we're able to release that information. But back to the basic importation, um, when the pigs came over from China, um, the stock was split into three research herds. Uh, and what we know as far as documented, um, a scientific uh, study was done that showed that all those, although those hogs came over together, once they were split in their three different facilities, genetic drift happened. So um, between 1989 and 2016, when the hogs were released, they changed genetically, which is really phenomenal when you think about it. So uh, as we were building the association, because I did have the um, the privilege to work with Rico when he was building the AMBA, uh, we decided to call those three facilities essentially the three lines where the pigs came from. So those three facilities are the University of Illinois, which we call U of I or Illinois in the herd book, uh, the USDA Meat Research Center, uh, which we refer to as USDA, and then Iowa State, which is IS in the herd book. Um, as far as the classification of the Maishan, they are considered a medium-sized lard hog, which means that you're not going to end up with a 1,200-pound hog on your farm. I personally love that because it doesn't mean that I, I, I don't have to have fences for 1,200-pound hogs, so that's a huge benefit to me. Um, and like we I'd mentioned before, um, they are prized in China um, for the succulent meat and um, being a lard hog, uh, they've got an amazing lard um, and good fat. I actually sell leaf lard through my store quite well. Um, it, I see in the chat that we have a few things there. Uh, still learning this program, I, I use a little bit different one. Is there anybody that has any questions um, so far? Oh, hey, Astrid. Okay, all right, then let's go to the next slide. If there's no questions, I can always stop or we can answer them in the end. So more about the hogs themselves, the breed characteristics, like I said, they are a lard hog, which means they have no problem making fat, um, medium-sized hog. Um, the adult weights is something that we're actually working on uh, through the association. The first information that we had said that they were gonna be, you know, a 350-ish pound hog. I've had some that I know are 700 pounds that I've run. So um, one thing to know about the Maishan, since we have a majority of new people here, is we are still very much right in the book as we go. So as we enter, um, I think we're in year six right now uh, with hogs in the registry, um, one of the things that, that we will do is put out essentially a, a study so that all these members that are processing hogs now can tell us what they're getting for hanging weights. Um, we've got one member that has a live weight scale that we're working on that to see what the percentage of hanging weight to live weight could be. So that's why that number is, is uh, so variable right now. It's something that within the Maishan, there is a difference and, and we're working on what does that mean and what does that look like? So this next one is a big one. Uh, I find that most of the people that get into the Maishan are new to pigs. And this 11 week deal will throw a wrench in the works for you. Um, they, they can breed, the earliest known breeding is 10 and a half weeks, uh, which on your boar side, that's fantastic. You know, you can get to work, you can start producing piglets, but on your gilt side or your female side, you don't want that. Uh, it will stunt the growth. Um, it typically makes them have kind of a cranky attitude. Um, they do grow a little bit more. Um, it doesn't totally ruin them but it is something to consider. So, you know, one of the plans that I borrowed from, um, excuse me, Wendy Palmer, Imperial Maishans is, is, you know, we recommend a lot of times you get your female first and let her grow up and go through those heat cycles and then come back and add your boar later. Uh, the good news is, is there's enough pigs out there now where you can do that. Before it was simply, we've got to get breeding pairs on the ground so that we can uh, work on our recovery numbers. So um, for you guys that are new, definitely keep that in mind as far as that breeding age and keeping them apart. Um, they're not an aggressive hog, but they are lovers. So if you, um, you know, if you've got them together and they're all sweet and all of a sudden, yeah, they're going to they're going to make more babies maybe before you knew it. Um, litter sizes that can range between nine and 19 piglets. And I, I know that's a huge range. And, and a lot of people see that the Maishan is 17 to 19 piglets. 
What I can tell you is that it depends on your genetic structure of your livestock to where you're going to land with that. If you are heavier in University of Illinois with some uh, USDA mixed in there, you're going to you're going to throw your numbers closer to that 19. If you're heavier on USDA, then you're going to potentially have lower numbers per litter. So um, believe it or not, 19 is not what everybody wants, especially if you could have two litters a year. So that's just something to keep in mind in your stock planning. Um, the teat count, 16 to 20 teats, um, so they can raise the litters, yes. Um, so this, this information came directly from mayshonbreeders.com, which is our breed association page. Um, and I do want to talk about the sedentary and docile pig part of it. I've got a slide on that later because I think that's an incredibly important topic for us to go over. Um, the minimal environmental impact on pastures and woodlots. I experienced that here myself. Uh, I would call the Mayshon a shallow rooter. Um, a little bit of history on me in terms of hogs as I started with those um, show pigs that the guy had up the road for $35 a piece. And, you know, cool, it's great, but they were trying to eat us alive. And they were trying to dig uh, to China, oddly enough, <laughs> is what we jokingly say. So um, the Mayshon is night and day difference. For me to come from pigs that were so destructive that I couldn't let them out on my pasture, that were eating my chickens alive and would have eaten us, um, the Mayshon is definitely a docile pig uh, with very little impact on uh, my pastures and my woodlots. Um, any questions on that, please jump in and let me know. Um, the last note on this one, um, <clears throat> and this is pretty much why you didn't really see Mayshons in the uh, in the U.S. until of late, because the, the, the agreement was that only zoos and the research facilities could hold the pigs um, until the experiments were done, which is when RICO bought the remaining herds from the USDA and University of Illinois and uh, kicked off this adventure that we're on today. So uh, does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? I feel like it is a ton of information I'm throwing at you. Let me uh, actually put, give you a couple of the questions that have come in on the Q&A, Laura. Okay, great. Um, and if you could tell me if this if this is gonna be, um, if you're gonna address these later, we can we can hold them. But can um, how would Meishan and Kuni Kuni be bred is one question that someone asked. Uh, can they elaborate? I see that, uh, looks like Logan asked that. Is that, you mean like to cross breed them? Is that the point on that or? I, I would assume that's probably the point, but, um, Logan, feel free to write in if you okay. have. Well, let me just share my, my opinion on it. A lot of people think that because I only work with registered stock and I am who I am, that I'm totally against crossing the Mayshon, and that's not the case. I think that the Mayshon has a ton to offer lots of breeds. Um, and if that's something that you know you think is something that would benefit you, then I would say do it. Um, my thoughts as far as specific to Cooney Coon is you're taking a pig that can be known for lard um, with another pig known for lard. Um, I'm not sure what it would do on your feed program because in terms of what a Mayshon needs and what a Cooney Coon needs, it's night and day difference. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's a bad thing, but um, I don't really know, um, you know, depending on what the breeding program is after, do you want, you know, a larger hanging weight? Do you want <laughs> more piglets? Um, sure, it could absolutely work. Um, the next question we have is, what age do you recommend a gilt be bred? So age is one thing that I use, but weight is more important. So I want a gilt to be really a 200 pound gilt. I want her to have enough weight on her that she can maintain and carry the pregnancy. And that also means that her body condition is in such that she's more mature as far as her frame and her structure so that it's not going to impede her growth. Um, that depends on your feed program and some of these um, differences within the genetics that we've talked about. Um, that can be typically six to nine months. Six months can be a little early on that weight. Um, you know, my vet told me to, to breed them at four months. Um, I think I, I just can't do that. <laughs> so I think it's important that they have a good body condition and, and that 200 pound mark ultimately. Awesome. All right, here's a, um, another question. Uh, with their limited environmental impact on pastures and woodlands, they seem to be well-suited for regenerating soils. 
do they root around at all? I know some folks who use hogs as an alternative to tilling the soil, uh, the soil and for controlling brush. Do you have any experience using machans in this way? Excuse me. Uh, I, I do think they're ideal for regenerative and it's their shallow rooting practices that I think make it most ideal. Um, you will find that your feed program can dictate how much they, um, they root. Um, I've worked with a breeder, uh, Katie Kelly, who's on here too, um, out of Illinois, Terra by Thai Farm. And there's, there is a correlation to essentially what carbs you're feeding or not feeding your hogs and how much they root. Um, the Maison does not need what we call a wet feed or a feed with molasses on it. A dry feed suits them well. Um, but um, yeah, I do think based on um, what I know about the regenerative aspect, which is something I'm slowly moving to myself, I think the Maison is, is really ideal. So a follow-up on that um, when they're ready to be bred question is uh, what's their slaughter time frame? When do they, what age do they get to slaughter weight? I think that depends on what you want to do with the Maison. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the breed. My focus was initially and still is, how do I make my, my business viable with the Maison? So what I had to prove is that I could achieve a hanging weight in a time frame with a retail, va retail value that was profitable. So for me, um, my sweet spot is 13 to 15 months. My hanging weights are 300 to 330 pounds. That makes what I do incredibly competitive. Um, in fact, my charcuterie or cured carcass value, which we'll talk about later, is over $6,000 when I do that. Um, so that, that's what works for me. But one of the other great things about the Maison and what I see some other folks doing with it is two things. Um, one, we've got a breeder that is uh, in Oregon, Elemental Acres, and her processor has a max weight limit. And I wanna say it's like 250-ish pounds. Um, but the Maison, she's still able to run them at about a year and achieve her goals with her food truck in that model. Um, the third thing that I would suggest is that if you want to do this at home and you want something for the kitchen table that you can work up a whole hog easily or roast hogs, the Maison can do that for you too. So I think it just depends on what your needs are for your, your model as to where you would want to run your Maisons. That 250 pounds, was that hanging weight or live weight? I'm pretty sure that's a live weight. So that's, okay. that's kind of tough. Okay. Yeah, we, we can get more information from Rebecca. I think she she wasn't able to attend today, but um, I'm starting to hear more and more processors are starting to have a live weight limit like that. Awesome. Um, just being conscious of time, I think maybe we'll hang on to the end of these other questions and we'll um, continue with the presentation. Does that sound okay. good, Laura? Sure. All right, let me see if I'm hitting the right button here. Okay, so next slide. All right, let's talk about the Breed Association. Uh, so that was formed in 2016. The first hogs were registered in 2017. Um, I think that RICO had a much more significant challenge in launching the Breed Association than I did because nobody had heard of these hogs. Um, it, was, it was quite the joke to my store when somebody would walk in and say, what are these pigs? And they'd say, look, somebody wants to talk pigs. And um, I would get so excited. And uh, the joke was they were going to get me a button that said, ask me about my pigs. And now people find me. Now people come in and they ask about the Maison because they read about it or heard about it elsewhere. So that's a big change uh, that we've seen within the association. Um, in the middle of COVID, uh, Rico, the founder, Rico Silvera, uh, decided that he was ready to retire from pigs and uh, wanted me to take over his work. And so we did. So we moved the uh, foundation herd and his breeding herd down from Tennessee. And in April um, of 2020, we did that. In May, I became registrar. And in October, I officially became president. So since that time, uh, I personally have delivered over 150 hogs, like I talked about earlier, uh, and that has really been the turning point of the Maison, just as I had hoped. Because they are so prolific, I knew that if we could get a good base out across the country, that uh, the rest would take care of itself, uh, and it has, as we're just about to register hog 700 in the registry. Does anybody have any questions about that one or those, I see some Q and A's. What, what do you think, Larissa, which way you wanna go here? Well, let's see. Um, I think 
a lot of this is about breeding. Um, you, may, you may cover a lot of these. They weren't necessarily on this slide in reference to this slide. Okay. Yeah, I, I will cover some of these, I'm sure. Um, AI is something I want to talk about in the breeding uh, slide. That's a great question. So, okay, next slide. All right, critically endangered status. So this is something that's really drawn a lot of people to the Maishan. They see the, um, the need for folks to raise them. They see value in the stock. And so they jump in ready to make this change. And, and it's changing, just like I talked about in our registry numbers. So there were originally 12 hogs uh, in the registry. And like I mentioned in the last slide, uh, it was precarious there for the first several years. Um, it was really just last year that I felt like that we're, we're out of the woods. Now, I wouldn't say that we're, we're done being critically endangered, but I think that the foundation has been laid and the momentum is there that it's going to carry us to where, um, where we can go. I think the Maishan has a lot of, um, a lot of, huge heights ahead of them that we're going to achieve. I did want to cover why is this a thrive and not a recover? Uh, you know, a lot of things are all about recovering genetics and things like that, but we have to remember that the Maishan was really never here before. This isn't like, um, you know, some of the other breeds that um, have a history in the U.S. It really, its history lies in China, and until those other two uh, research facilities released their genetics in 2016, there really was not enough genetics on the ground um, to make a go of the Maishan. In fact, several people had gotten out of it at that point because they felt like there was no genetic future for it. So we're actually identifying the pathway, figuring out where they fit in the U.S. and um, making sure that they have a stable future. It's, it's as if we're coming in and throwing an elbow uh, and saying, hey, here's this pig and it's, it's, it's got all these things to offer and let's go. Uh, and I absolutely love that. So it's it's just really amazing to be a part of this with so many uh, things to learn and things in front of us. Um, again, can't say enough about our member breeders um, because it's it's not just me that has made this happen. It's everybody else that's worked so tirelessly to make sure the Maishan has a pathway in the U.S. Um, the Livestock Conservancy did recognize the danger of failure early on. I remember that call when Rico said, we're, we're there. They said it was a two-year journey. They fast-tracked us. The Livestock Conservancy is going to list us as critically endangered, and this is a turning point. This, this certainly um, invigorates the cause, and I think that that's very much the case, and the Livestock Conservancy has also done a lot to support the Maishan in their work as well. So 2018 uh, is when the Livestock Conservancy declared as critically endangered, um, in one of my, my newsletters, in fact, my end of the year from the president's desk newsletter from the AMBA, I, I had mentioned that we were registering a lot of hogs. And I actually received a fair amount of uh, emails from our members saying, oh, no, oh, no, I don't no, we can't drop that. So I do want to point out that uh, the Livestock Conservancy and their wisdom does feel like that we need to achieve a certain amount of hogs every year for a consistent amount of time to make sure that we truly have um, kind of uh, plateaued in the critically endangered group so that we don't go back to it. Is there any questions here? We'll go on to the next slide and then come back to them. Okay, so uh, this is some more really important stuff, especially for you new guys out there. Um, is all Maishan stock the same? So um, there's not, and I see this as two different perspectives. Um, I've already touched on one, that your combination of the three genetic lines can define what your weights and litter counts are. So to me, again, that's, that's not a bad thing. It's the option that we have as far as which way do you want to go with the hogs? Um, excuse me. And again, that combination is the, the Illinois USDA tend to have your largest hogs with your largest litters. Um, the other really important note here is the stock pre-AMBA is really not the same caliber as the AMBA stock. And I, I had worked with that stock as Rico was, was building the association. And for what I needed, the hanging weights simply weren't there. Um, 164 pound hanging weight, um, 12 to 15 pound hams, which when you're trying to run a commercial business out of it, it's just simply not viable. Um, so in all the aspects from hanging weight to litter count to farrowing ability to mother capabilities, 
um, the genetic options, in my opinion, uh, everything that is of the new genetics from the AMBA is far superior to uh, stock pre that release. I realize that's probably going to ruffle some feathers, but I'm here to share my opinion and what I've found, and and that's what it is. <laughs> so uh, ready for the next slide. All right, how to feed the Maishan for success. So again, this goes to what you want your farm model to be. We've talked about my model in that it is all about how do I get to the hanging weight and um, the, the, the carcass weight that I need for my retail store. So to do that, I have found that I need to, fit, to feed my Maishans a consistent feed. That means for me right now, I feed them every day. I am looking at options on that, maybe over the summer to change that a little bit as the pastures are in more. Um, <clears throat> I have I've worked with some other um, members and breeders. Um, we had one that was feeding corn to their Maishan and that was a sad hog. So I, I don't recommend uh, corn. Um, and the other thing that we have found out the hard way is if your breeding stock is not getting a balanced hog ration or a balanced hog mineral and vitamin uh, supply that you can run into issues in the breeding life of the hog. Uh, one of our foundation cells um, didn't have enough calcium to be able to deliver her last litter and uh, we ended up doing a c-section. So that was a lack of calcium. And we know that Rico and I were both feeding food scraps and uh, that it left her deficient in those minerals that she needed. So that's why I always say that they should be on a balanced hog ration of some sort so that they get the nutrition that they need. Um, let's talk about cover crops because that is a huge subject. And I know regenerative is kind of the hot button right now. Uh, I'm going to step back from just what I do in the Maishan, that if you look in the, the world of ag, you see things kind of trickle down. So generally what happens in cows will happen in hogs, and it kind of just keeps rotating through that. So cover crops in cows have made tremendous headway. Uh, I have seen um, marbled grass-fed beef, which was phenomenal, uh, and I think that's coming in hogs. So right now, we don't know what that combination is for the Maishan. Uh, it is something that uh, I'm going to work with, and I know we have some other members that are doing that as well. I think that we'll be able to identify cover crops and how they best help them. Uh, we do have a member, if you look at the AMBA YouTube channel, Jonathan uh, of Oddbird Farm has a unique feed program where he's growing his own alfalfa. Uh, and using what grows on his farm and ending up with about, I guess with inflation, probably about $100 per pig in a feed cost. So there's there's options there. Again, I think it's a matter of what, what suits your farm. And I think that we'll figure out what suits the Maishan best as we continue to grow. And uh, next slide, unless you want to do questions. What kind of feed? Uh, there, we actually have a couple of questions in here um, we, that are related to feed. Okay. Um, Oh, actually, maybe maybe this will cover it. Go ahead. Maybe we'll do it after this slide. See if you haven't answered it. Okay. So I see that there's three options in term, terms of which way you want to go to feed your hog. Like I've talked about, my, my choice is a balanced hog feed consistently. Um, another note on that is when I started, I felt like that four pounds a day per hog was where I needed to be. And in the last year, uh, I've dropped that down to three pounds per hog per day. And I love it. Uh, we're getting less fat um, and more red meat. So I think that's, you know, that's a change that I'm going to stick with. But in general, the Maishan really doesn't need anything with fat. They make that just fine. So you want to keep a low fat feed if you can keep something at three or four percent on that. Low fiber, uh, I'd keep it at six or seven percent. Or if you have a means of not even feeding fiber, I don't know that they need a whole lot, especially if they're on pasture. Uh, you have to think about this in terms of, of people that if we're eating a lot of fiber, we're probably not building a lot of muscle. So the offset to that, of course, is always high protein. Uh, I've experimented with proteins as high as 40% with no negative effects. Uh, so in my opinion, I think anything you can do that's a high protein, low fiber and fat is going to be the ideal place to land with the nation. Uh, number two is the veggie food bake scraps alone. I've done that. Um, 
it is for, for me, it was the trade off of when I couldn't be out there to do it every day, if I had to either pay somebody to go through it all and then manage the trash, or I had to buy the feed. Ultimately, it was the same money, but I didn't have the trash to deal with on the feed. And it really gets hard to find people that want to work through food trash. So um, that was why I switched over to the hog feed and then found that the vitamin and mineral complex that they need was um, a bonus in doing that. Uh, the last one I know I've touched on too, as far as forage, fiber, and cover crops. Um, and again, we're just not there yet. Um, but I think that again is the beauty of the Mayshon that, that we are right in the book, that it is open to um, new opinions and new processes as we grow. Do you think, think we still have some questions there? Yeah, there is, there is one that just came in and I think you've partially answered it, but I'll read the whole question. Um, how can we determine if cover, cover crops can offset feeding programs? Can you go over your feed program, which you did? Um, is it a, based on percentage of hog weight or age? And can you discuss different protein sources and other supplemental minerals and whether you soak or not? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the soak is something that I would really love to do. Uh, but because of all the hats I wear, I don't know that that's something that I'm going to be able to implement. Um, one of the best feed programs that I have had here was when we would use milk whey from a local uh, dairy to uh, essentially ferment feed. So not only did it cut my food bill in half, but the lysine in the uh, milk whey, you know, that's the, the, the growth uh, element that you want for hogs. So I do think there's a lot to be gained from fermented feeds, but it really depends on your operation and what you can do. Uh, as far as other protein sources, uh, I'm limited. I am 42 miles east of Atlanta, so I simply don't have access to the feed mills and the bulk buys that a lot of you other guys do. So if there's something that you can do that you can work with, um, the 40%, for example, was a soybean um, top dressing, and it is a pretty common hog uh, additive, I would certainly work with your feed mill and see if, if you can do that. Uh, as far as a a weight of the hog to the percentage of feed. Um, that's not something I personally have ever worked with. Um, we were doing it based on uh, body condition. So before I ever, ever got into pigs in this, I was, I was a horse chick, a uh, trail rider. So for me with horses, it was a very dynamic program in that I evaluated every day and we adjusted based on how much they ate, how much they didn't eat, what was their body condition and what was the weather at the time. And I still take that approach very much so with my pigs. Uh, if they're not cleaning up their food at the rate of three pounds per pig per day, <clears throat> then I'm going to short them a day. Uh, in my opinion, if your hogs are laying around and they're not getting up at feeding time, you may be feeding them too much. It may be that carb thing where um, you need to lean them out a little bit. And I think that you'll end up with less fat for it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different approaches uh, to this, just like a lot of other livestock um, and I, I hope I answered all your questions. Did I miss anything in there? No, I'm really impressed you remembered them all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I would have forgotten and I would have been asking you to help me. But um, uh, yeah, no, that was it. You did a good job. Thank you. Sure. All right. So we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, how do I raise my Maishans? I'm a huge, huge advocate of pasture. Uh, I feel like that my animals should be raised as naturally as possible with that one bad day that they go to the processor. So um, that was a big advantage to me in moving to the Maishan is that I had to have something that could run on my pastures and the other pigs just simply wouldn't do it. Um, and again, the next part here, as far as the lard hog, um, I think we've kind of covered that as far as, you know, they can create fat just fine. Um, I was talking to another member and I saw this question in here about how do they do on hills? And personally, I think that's kind of brilliant, especially if you put like the uh, feet at the top and the water at the bottom or vice versa, because they're walking up and down that hill and they're building muscle. Um, so I, I love that idea. If you guys have that option, we're, we're gently rolling hills here. So I don't have that here in Loganville. Um, as far as raising them in barns, um, I'm not set up for that. I do know that in some areas uh, you have to because of the weather or maybe your um, your land is not in position that you can just leave the, uh, the hogs out on it. Uh, and I think people are finding their own success with that. Um, and I can uh, certainly direct you to some of those folks if, if you guys wanna talk more about that. 
Um, one of the questions that I saw last night was somebody asked about how they do in 20 below weather. Um, I'm in Atlanta. If it's below freezing for two days, we think we're dying. So <laughs> I'm probably not your best person. Uh, I can tell you after going to Michigan to pick up hogs that um, the Maishon that I have seen up there is, is generally you're going to treat it like you do any other livestock, that barn raising your stock in those conditions may be just simply what you have to do for your area. Uh, I would also add, and this will go into some other things too, on the Maishon Breeders website, on the association website, there is a thing called the Breeder Locator. And if you guys are interested about certain climates, we have breeders probably in those climates or close enough to them that they would be happy to talk to you about what it's like for them to raise pigs in those conditions so you know what you need to set up for. All right, temperament. Ah, yeah, here we are. Okay, cool. So I was talking to Larissa about this one um, when we were kind of queuing up for everybody. I think that this is probably one of the most misunderstood topics for the Maishan. So everybody reads that they're docile and then they get their pigs and then it's like, love them or not. So, you know, I asked myself, excuse me, why is that? What is, what is the difference there in it? And what I think it is, is it depends on excuse me, good lunch, um, what perspective you're coming from. So like I said, I had those large breed hogs that were going to eat us. They were eating our chickens. Um, I couldn't let them out on pasture. Uh, we had to actually carry firearms to load them and go in there with them. Uh, they, they were pretty awful and I just couldn't do that. So that's actually how I found the Maishan. So when I come from that perspective, the Maishan is easy peasy. They're just, you know, I'm going to keep all my fingers. My kids are safe. It's all good. Um, but people that are new to uh, pigs and livestock and even breeding programs, which can be tough to jump into with any animal, um, when the pigs get grumpy or grumbling or they posture, um, it kind of scares them. And, and I get it because it can be, their goal is to be intimidating. So if you're not used to it and you've come from, either no pigs at all or something so super docile, you're not sure about it. Uh, it can be one of those things that makes you say, wait, is this where I wanna be? And, you know, I mean, to each their own on that. Um, but, you know, the other notes that play into this is um, the Maishans are probably one of the best reads of energies that I've seen. I learned this the hard way because when we would first load out hogs, I knew my store had to open. I knew it couldn't open without my hogs. So when I went out there, I was wound up. It had to happen. And those pigs knew it. And wow, did we have some adventures. <laughs> so I've learned to slow down, put my energy in check and just go out there and be calm and ask them. And I get an entirely different hog than I did before. Um, another feature of the Maishan, we'll call it a feature, uh, is they do make you earn their trust. So if, you know, if you've hauled these hogs to your farm and now they're at a new place and they got hauled, and they're trying to figure out what's going on, they're going to evaluate you before they just lay down for a belly rub. So between your energy and uh, kind of earning your trust, those are things that I've seen um, kind of make or break different breeding operations. And then again, I would just suggest that just, just consider what docile really means in the pig world. Uh, it doesn't mean that these hogs are aggressive by any means, but a pig is a pig and they're, they're going to bark and make noise um, like pigs do. So... Um, I'd love to answer more questions on that down the road uh, towards the end of it. So breeding practices for success. <clears throat> this was a mess for me. I learned this the hard way. When I brought in the foundation herd and had that whole backlog, um, I was pairing the boars and sows together for three days because that's their heat cycle, right? Wasn't getting any piglets uh, on the ground. Uh, there were several things at play here. And these were actually the things that, that, that I did to turn my breeding program around. So I always recommend that you pair your boar and your sow together for uh, two heat cycles, which is generally 45 days to make sure that your sow or gilt is covered. Um, the, the heat cycle is a little deceiving with hogs in that when you see signs of heat, the egg could have already dropped and you may have missed that cycle and you don't know that. So that's why it's important that you get full coverage on the heat cycles to make sure you have the best chances of your sow or gilt being bred. Uh, vaccinate. I am pro vaccinating my breeding stock. I do not vaccinate anything for meat and I don't vaccinate piglets that I sell to others unless requested. Uh, I had problems with varying litter size, stillborns, uh, E. coli issues, um, 
and then we vaccinate for um, uh, pneumonia as well, uh, because those were all things that I either had heard could be an issue like pneumonia, as far as that's what Rico had shared, or the other issues that I was seeing within my herd. So uh, again, not everybody does that or needs to do it, um, but it's something that I have found has made a tremendous difference in my breeding operation. Uh, we also uh, had to make sure that we had the right place for them to farrow. I am anti-cages as far as farrowing cages. I believe in stalls with the rails so that when the sows lay up against that side of uh, the shed that they're in, the piglets have somewhere to go. Uh, there's a ton of ways to do that. We actually use T-post and muffler clamps because we are mechanics, not carpenters, and it works very well for us. Uh, I do believe in dipping the umbilical cords in a betadine solution uh, in the first 48 hours. I did lose a piglet to an infection through that early on. So that's one of those super cheap insurance policies that I use on my farm. Uh, medical kit, there's a lot of things that you could have, um, you know, in general, you know, something for wounds. Um, if you think you may have piglets that you'll end up raising, um, there's some things you need for that. If anybody has any questions on that stuff, it may be better if you just reach out and ask me specifically what you would, you know, what, what are you preparing for? And I'm happy to share with you what we do. And the last one um, is the one that I have cried with many, many of you about um, because breeding is never a guarantee. Um, by and large, the Maishans do phenomenal in breeding. Uh, sometimes things happen though. So uh, the first thing you've got to know is you, you do the best you can and give yourself grace and keep moving, uh, you know, for the next time. So any other thoughts or points on that one before we move on? I actually have a question. Um, okay. So how do you find, because we raise, we raise mangalitsas mm -hmm. and I'm going to be polite and say that they're Anyway, I'm not going to be rude about mangalitsas, but we are getting rid of them all and hopefully getting some Michons um, <laughs> this year. This year we're doing it. Um, but um, so you say you dip the umbilical cords uh, when they when they're first born. How do how do the mothers react to you touching their babies? Mangalitsas don't like it. Ah, very very so super aggressive. We how, have how we have some that don't care. We have some that do care. But um, what we try to do is. Uh, two things. So one, if you've ever seen a pig pharaoh, it's uh, or give birth, um, it's as if they're in a trance. So if you can catch them kind of in that moment as as they're delivering babies and they're doing their thing, um, I've gotten really fast at it. So I take my little Ziploc out there with my um, betadine solution and my washcloth, and I can pick up a piglet, dob it, dob it, dob it, and work, <laughs> and I can be out of there in like five minutes. Now, um, if she's still farrowing and she's she's gruffing like she's going to get up, I get out of there because that can be the kiss of death to piglets. So we'll give her time and we'll let her settle. Um, and then for those sows that are more hormonal and don't want you in there, what we'll do is take a sort board in there and two people. So one will usually use a sort board to distract mom and can also be that go between between the piglets and the sow. Uh, and then that second person can do the do that dobbing. And I don't know if you're going to ask this one or not. And Lars, I'm totally like taking over. I'm sorry, you go. I was just going to ask the one about the AI. Is it available for Michons yet? It is not. It is not. And we, to my knowledge, we're the only breed that does not allow AI as a form of uh, entering pigs into the registry. Um, I'm happy to talk about that at, at length. Essentially, AI has never been allowed for the Maishan um, for two reasons. One uh, is excuse me, was we didn't want to devalue boars when we knew that we had a steep hill to climb. So um, that, and then the second reason is we didn't want popular boar syndrome, meaning that let's say your farm, you're really good at AI and you only have two boars and now you're effectively skewing the genetics and the future of the Maishan across the country because of your program. So uh, where the registry is with that now is we, we are not anti-AI. The biggest challenge is there is simply no pathway to do it right now. Um, there is no, no switch that I can flip. There is, you know, it all has to be designed. It all has to be built. Um, and that's going to take time to do. I do think you'll see it in the Maishan within the next few years. But um, you are correct right now. AI is, is not allowed. 
and actually this came up a couple of times in the Q and A. Someone, uh, folks are wondering how many years uh, can you continue breeding a sow? Okay, so the, the general rule of thumb in hogs in general, uh, if you're running a really tight breeding operation, you really want to have a replacement after three years. Um, is that when Mayshawn stopped breeding? No, um, we've had some go into four years. Uh, we're actually watching uh, the oldest breeding boar active, still actively producing babies is actually at Imperial Mayshawn's with Wendy. And I'm pretty sure that Bo is approaching five years old. So in my experience, your sows start losing fertility and the ability to breed in that fourth year. And I've had boars do the same thing. So we don't really know what was the difference in what I have versus Bo. Um, but again, if you want to make sure that you're hitting your marks and it's all about production, your safest bet is to plan on three years and anything after that is just a bonus. There's my kappa. <laughs> All right, so that picture in the bottom right is one of our favorite pictures. That is a Maishan kappa roast. And that's one of the uh, unique cuts that uh, we do here at the farm or my processor does it for me. And that's where my husband and I built our own American charcuterie style carcass breakdown. Um, that's effectively the top of a Boston butt. Uh, as you guys probably all know, uh, Boston butts are really more of a commodity piece, which in our world means it can be a real struggle to get the value you need for it. So instead of uh, cutting Boston butts, we cut a copper roast and then I sell that. You'll see in another slide, we sell those for roughly $25 a pound or I cure them into Capicola. That's also what some of our customers have used as a roast, and they have replaced prime rib with it. Uh, it is phenomenal, and we've even had customers come in and tell me that uh, they ended up in a fight over it because the wife had bought it to get home. They had it for their special event, and the husband said, where'd you get this beef? She said, it's not beef. He said, yeah, that's beef, and no, it was not. It was Maishan, so um, it, it's a really unique piece, great, great for the hog. Uh, you see the red coloring and the micro marbling in that piece as well. Um, low and slow is really where you want to be with Maishan meat. And it's because of the lard hog side of them and, and the tenderness of the fat. So um, you don't want to cook them like the white meat pork from the store or you won't be that happy with it. Uh, and then uh, that picture of the copper roast that we're looking at, that's from James Patton, who is coming online in Tennessee with Mayshans um, at my master class, my Mayshan master class that I teach twice a year. Carcass value, this is a big one. And so this is the picture that I was talking about. I don't know if your screen is like mine. Uh, I could probably move the photos around on the right, but you are seeing that right, uh, $170 for that copper roast. Um, and Usually they sell like that. We've got some uh, some smoke smokers, people with big green eggs and specialty smokers that love to get them and, and smoke them for special occasions. Um, Mariel has a question. We'll come back to that one in just a second one. Um, so I look at a carcass in two ways. Uh, the raw cuts is over 2,500 and that's like taking the ham and turning it into grinds and things like that. But if I cure it, um, the carcass is over $6,000. Um, my hams alone will um, run between 750 and 2500 depending on the weight of the hog. Um, just a little side note here, uh, I just ran some hogs last week, that's what these coppas came from, uh, was able to achieve my hanging weights and 30 pound hams, which is huge. So we, we've pretty much doubled where we started from. And, and again, that just makes it more viable on the retail side. Um, did Mary have a question about chops, I think? Yes, uh, the question is, when talking about pork chops, how much lard do you cut off the ends? So my customer prefers about a half inch on the lard. Uh, we have some that um, they like for us to leave a larger fat cap, like up to an inch on it, so that they... Um, it's like they take the chop and they put it on end and that way it like fries the out, outer edge into a really, really delicious dish. Um, but, but largely uh, we stick it about a half inch on the cap. Oh, and Bo's five and a half years, says Wendy. So that's fantastic. Um, yes, we can talk about the prices like Rhonda had mentioned. Um, 
And that's, uh, I've got a slide in here on marketing. We'll talk about that. So you want to hop over to the next slide there, Larissa? When do I process and what are my cuts? We touched on that earlier. The 13 to 15 months gives me the results that I need, uh, the hanging weights that I like, uh, and the retail value that I need. Um, the American charcuterie style carcass breakdown that I teach in my shop. Uh, essentially, that means if you start from the back of the hog, um, where the belly meets the ham, we're just cutting straight up. So I'm getting that in a primal so that I can take that ham and trim it for our prosciutto. Uh, the chops go into belly, excuse me, the chops go into pork chops, the belly goes into bacon. Uh, we've got spare ribs um, that we sell as well. And then when we move to the shoulder, uh, I've got that copper roast and then that lower shoulder always goes into grinds as far as sausages and ground pork. From the head, I do get the jowl, the snout, the ears, and the cheek meat. Cheek meat's phenomenal if you've never had that. So those are the cuts that we pull from uh, the Maison. I'm actually going to start a pancetta uh, license so that we can also cure the belly into that as well. And that'll mean effectively everything but the ribs and the carcass can go into a cure or a prosciutto that I can sell uh, as a cured cut. So your cheeks, do you sell your cheeks? Uh, uh, do you uh, smoke them like you would with bacon or do you, or do you um, do more of like sell them just the whole cheek? We sell them as the whole cheek, like you would, uh, you'd braise them kind of thing if, um, you know, that's what you wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing we sell smoked is bacon. Uh, I don't have an operational smoker here right now. It's something that we may add in the future. All right, how to market the Maison. This is huge. Uh, so I have seen that that a marketing program can truly be one of your biggest pathways to success. Um, if you are looking at the Maison for your personal use, this may not apply to you. Most people uh, see what the carcass values are on the Maison and they see the value to them, so they want to sell it. So uh, these are the, the steps that I use as far as to uh, develop where I'm gonna market and what I tell other people to do as well. So uh, the first thing I did when Rico told me about these weird looking pigs was, uh, was look at my market. Um, one of the issues that I had was in, uh, that was what, 2016, and it was a $4 a pound pork market around here and everybody had the same pigs or it didn't matter. Well, quick math will tell you that um, it's really hard to run a store on $4 a pound retail value on pork. So I immediately saw a value um, in uh, the Maison for that. Um, we're also, like I said, we're, we're really close to Atlanta. Um, most of my customers are suburban folks that want great quality products and they want it by the cut. So the Maison uh, serves that well. Um, marketing is one of the things that, that people um, compliment us on the most uh, with our social media, especially on uh, Jensen Reserve and how we're able to market things there. Um, and that's taken a lot of time to develop our strategy and when to post and how to post. Um, social media is not, um, shouldn't be your, your only basket. In fact, it's a very dangerous game to have that as your only basket because roughly 10% or less of, of the people that like your page are going to see your post. So you've missed out on a lot of opportunity there. So I, I believe and have had great success with an email list um, because that's not as limited as um, whatever algorithm is going on at the time. So um, that's all part of developing a strategy. Uh, a lot of folks think that if they do it and grow it and offer it, that sales will just come to them. And the reality is, is you really need to have an idea of what your market is and a strategy on how to build your business, how to capture customers, and then you need to think about if you're going to, if you bought a breeding pair and now you want to make breeding pairs, you're going to have four, four hogs, two boars, two sows. Uh, they're going to have at least one litter a year. You could be all of a sudden you could have 30 more pigs there. So what is your plan? You know, are you going to eat that many? You know, do you know neighbors that want to, or are you going retail, are you going restaurants? These are all things that I really think that everyone should think through before they they commit to uh, to the Maison. And then finally, all that stuff is great, but then you've, you've got to figure out what does it look like to make it happen? How do you go get these customers? And then how do you time it with your pork availability? So these are things that I'm happy to talk to you guys about. It's all part of the pig nerd as far as the um, consulting program 
that I can help you specific to your farm. Um, you can also email me with questions too, um, you know, some simple ones and I'm, I'm happy to jump in there because this, this is a very long legged spider that is probably equally important as how you care for your stock. What is the future of the May shot? Oh, very bright, very, very bright. Um, the association is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, we are probably signing up two to five new members a week, which is huge. You know, when I started this, I would go three weeks and wouldn't need to really do a whole lot with it. And now I'm spending um, a couple of days a week uh, hard on the association and the registry. So that just shows you about the volume uh, that we're doing. Again, more and more people know about the Mayshon. And I'm seeing other member breeders that are finding their pathway. Um, there's another breeder in Oregon, uh, Northwest Farm, that um, has done well with suckling pigs, which is something I hadn't considered. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of the breed and the association is it is it's not my place to tell you how to raise your pigs or how you should do it or what is right for you. But the Mayshon brings so much to the table that there is a ton of opportunities to make the Mayshon fit what you need at your farm. Uh, and then uh, as far as who, who else is out there, we have an amazing group of members. Everybody is so determined to make this work and they're so happy to talk about it from their perspective and what they do that, um, you know, reach out to them. I, I'm not the only one. I'm, again, I'm happy to help, um, but we've got other members that I think would, uh, would serve you well too, as far as how their operation runs and what you would like. Uh, and again, retail sales and charcuterie uh, is growing like crazy. I'm actually working on a charcuterie class by popular demand that will be out hopefully next week, as soon as I can confirm processing dates. And I just think it's really important to share that we are making a difference. We're saving this pig with what we do. So that's really exciting to me. All right. So here's how you can find us on the whole, as far as on the Mayshawn side of things, on the, the pig itself. Um, this is, these are our three Facebook pages. Um, the, the Breed Association has a page and that's where I post things specific to the association that you can com comment on. The forum is for members or people that wanna talk about registered stock uh, and anybody can post there and talk about it. Make Mine Mayshine Pigs is a group ran by all those amazing members out there as far as moderators. And that's for anything Mayshine. Maybe it's your crosses, maybe it's, um, you know, is this hog Mayshine influenced, anything like that, they're happy to help. Uh, we also have Instagram uh, on the American Mayshon Breeders Association. Uh, YouTube channel on American Mayshon Breeders Association too. We've got some exciting things coming up there with some of the things I mentioned at the beginning of our um, talk today. So there's me. <laughs> so these are my four businesses. And uh I got to say thank you again to FACT and, and you ladies, because this is the first time I've actually had all four of them together like this. So I started with Jensen Reserve in 2017 for that retail pathway in the retail store. We do ship Mayshon nationwide as long, excuse me, as well as our charcuterie and our other products. Mayshon Preservation is my live pig operation. Uh, I've got a lot of blogs there about my experiences with the Mayshon. And uh, I know one of the questions that came in last night was what are the weights per cut and what is the carcass value? There is a blog uh, on Mayshon Preservation that outlines that for you. And those are actually pigs that I did not grow. I partnered with Wendy Palmer at Imperial so that we had some separation there. It wasn't just all everything I'm seeing. Um, the American Mayshon Breeders Association, I think we talked about that pretty well today. It's an honor to be president of that and uh, work with all these amazing folks. And then uh, the pig nerd. So that's uh, that's what they call me too, the pig nerd. Um, that, that's a joke that Rico and I came up with when we would just talk about Mayshons all the time. So a joke turned business, but uh, I'm happy to help you define your pathway in the food business, uh, especially with the Mayshon and meats. I've helped several other people identify what works best for them and save them a lot of time and money in doing that. So that's uh, that's where you find me. There's my four businesses. All right. And I think uh, this is one of our, our last uh, slides, if not the last one. And, and I just want to say thank you again to FACT and Larissa and Sam. 
Um, you've been there and supported us as farmers. I was talking to another member earlier that you guys are fantastic and we, we really can't thank you enough. What we do seems daunting on, on a good day. Um, and I just appreciate you, you allowing us this opportunity to share our, share our pigs with you. Oh, thank you, Laura. <laughs> well, we're just delighted that you are able to, to join us today. We do have maybe five minutes or so to take some of the questions that, um, I know there's we have some that are um, in the q and I'm Before we do that, I'm going to just pop up on your screen uh, another poll for folks. If you could take just, it'll probably take you 15 seconds to fill it out. We'd appreciate it. Just give us some feedback on your experience today. Um, Sam, if you want to take a question or two while I yeah. do that, that'd be awesome. So Jacqueline asks, do you run Michons with other livestock like chickens, goats, sheep, or dwarf-sized cattle, et cetera? If yes, is there a time when you would separate them? Looking for a good option for a small homestead. Um, I run them with my chickens. Um, and I really, I, I did have goats with them, but then uh, my vet informed me that goats should not eat grain or feed. So that didn't really work out for me. Um, we do have a member that I was talking to in the last two weeks that's raising them with his cattle and he's having no issues. So I thought that was fantastic. I think the 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 two things that I would be wary of or would define my answer is um, what is the feed profile for the other animals and does it fit with the Maishan? And then two, is there a safety issue either way, you know, um, with, with breeding stock, for example, with horses? I don't know, you know, hormones and things get going. I don't know that I would breed or farrow in with um, other livestock. All right, thank you for that. Um, Laura, another question. Uh, how do the Mishans do on poor or unimproved pasture? Well, I think that they uh, will help clean it up just like other breeds. Uh, I had a, an island in my pasture that had all kinds of scrub and stuff uh, under some other trees and they certainly clean that out to everything they could reach. And again, I think the shallow rooting makes it really ideal that you could hand cast seed and work on, you know, your your cover crops or, or your regenerative side. All right, and I'm going to ask this question just because I think it's really funny and I can't imagine because I've got big pigs. I've got those mangalids as um, Carl wants to know, could you leash train them so it's easy to move them from different pastures or load them, yeah. which I think is the funniest question ever. I don't know. No. I've never it's well, a great question. I love it. It is. Somewhere <laughs> out there, there's a picture of a Maishan wearing a dog, dog harness at the lake for the day because oh my they turned them into a pet. Now it was a barrow. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can leash train them. I actually have been bottle raising a piglet. She's in the next room over, hopefully staying quiet. And uh, yeah, she's just like a dog. You can house train them. Uh, you can do all that. Uh, if she wasn't going to grow up to be 600 pounds, I might keep her. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess that's the thing. Yeah, I could see doing it with a little pig, but doing it with a big pig, that's just sort of crazy. But yeah, I would I would recommend that you have them spayed or neutered if you're going to do that, uh, which I know is not really what she's talking about. We use uh, treats a lot. We have a bread store here yeah. where we get the cheap honey buns and, and they will follow that just about anywhere. Yeah. Cara, <laughs> if you ever at least train a Michon, I want to see that picture. That's right. That sure picture. <laughs> <laughs> tag us tag us on social media yes. um, <laughs> awesome oh uh, so what age uh do you recommend a boar before breeding him and i know you i know you you spoke about sow age i don't remember if you said anything about boar age i, I really haven't found that that you need to wait with a boar you know in, unless there's a height difference and um you know determined animals have a way of figuring that out too <laughs> but that's really more of what you what you face again somewhere there's a picture of my first boar standing on a bucket um and anyhow we had a great litter of piglets so really it's more <laughs> about um the height size and things like that there's not really a problem with the boars and early breeding um i'm gonna ask i think this is a good question too natural deworming practices uh-huh so again, that varies by farm. Personally, I'm an ivermectin person. You know, I, I like to deworm my herd twice a year. Um, I use a combination of injectable or the horse paste that I go back to those little Debbies to, to feed them. But, but I don't find that every farm needs to deworm. So I think it's one of those things that you need to evaluate your situation. 
Um, it is thought, and there is some information out there that says that the Maishans are more disease and worm resistant. And I think that there's breeder members out there that would agree with that in their experience. So I think you're right about that, especially if you've got a multi-species situation, it really does help mm -hmm. um, with, with parasites. So we don't have to warm our pigs because yeah. we, we've got other things coming through that take care of that for us. Yeah, yeah. So I'll ask one more and then I'll ask you, Sam, maybe you pick the last question. Um, here's okay. an easy one, maybe an easy one, Laura. Uh, someone asked, will you be offering a webinar on your charcuterie cuts class? Is that something you <laughs> consider doing? It is. I was actually uh, talking about that last night. So we're actually going to launch uh, the charcuterie school in three different ways. Uh, hopefully by the end of next week, ready to ship, excuse me, end of this week, ready to ship next week will be our first home cure kits. So I provide everything you need to create your own little Lanzina or Biltong style brazola or duck breast prosciutto so that it's cured in a 10 to 14 day window in your fridge and you're rocking and rolling. So from there, we'll add more whole mussels, larger mussels, and even prosciutto. Um, the first uh, class I think will be in April that we'll offer. That will come out uh, as soon as we get those processing dates. So that could be anywhere from two to 10 days. It's just, they're busy people. Sometimes it takes us a minute to connect. Uh, and what that'll be is I will teach you everything I know about charcuterie and you will take it home with you when the only exceptions being I won't share my license information or my my specific spice recipes, but I'll teach you how to how to do what I do in a two-day class. And we'll even have a charcuterie board class, meaning that uh, Denise, our social media manager and store manager, and I will each show you two different ways to create your own charcuterie boards that we'll get to enjoy as well. And there, there are a lot of good questions still, but I think this one is a very practical question. Can a single pair be kept together throughout breeding, gestation, birth, and piglet raising? If not, is it okay for a single pair to be kept separate without any other pigs on the farm? Um, yes and yes. And uh, I'm going to put an asterisk on the first one. And I would evaluate your stock. Uh, if your boar is one that's a little pushy and uh, doesn't respect your sow when she says get back as she's getting closer to farrowing, I would separate them. Uh, again, we have members that have breeding pairs together through farrowing. They rebreed. The dad's part of the deal in raising the piglets and it works out fine. Um, but yes, you can separate them out um, if you need to as well. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Laura, maybe we can talk about a Mishan 201 class. There's a lot yeah. of interest. I love <laughs> kind of that. Taking, oh, a, <laughs> taking the next step, <laughs> digging a little deeper in some of these, um, some of these areas. I know we just can't get to everything in an hour, but let me just before we sign off, let me just share a couple things. Reminder that the recording is uh, still underway. It's um, and the slides will be available very soon. I'm going to be archiving them on our website, which I post in the chat um, and also send out an email to everyone that registered so everyone that's on this email or on this on with us today and anyone that couldn't make it um, so you can refer to those in the future um, we do have many more webinars coming up um, next month and into into March so please take a look through those and I'll be sending out the registration links as well in my follow-up email um, but really I just want to thank you Laura it's really been an honor and a pleasure to connect with yeah. you and thank um, you and everybody <laughs> <laughs> Everybody that's here, I'm seeing the thank yous and all that. I, I'm grateful. Thank you. And just reach out. Let's grow this thing. Yep, exactly. It's, <laughs> we're, we're a community here and, um, you know, very friendly folks. And I really appreciate our audience members, all the interest that you show and everything that everyone's doing for their animals and for their communities. It's it's really wonderful. Um, also, thank you to you, Sam. Um, mm -hmm. Always fun to have you uh, <laughs> with me behind the scenes. We, we put on a good show, I think. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we appreciate everyone here and thank you for sticking around and for answering all our questions some of many of the questions that we had, Laura, um, uh, we hopefully we can do more of this in the future. So thanks, everyone. Have a great yeah. rest of your Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Tuesday and the rest of your week. And um, uh, look for an email from me uh, later today. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye.